Welcome back in. Hope you're doing well. This is the 2021 offseason, and we're covering the New York Jets again today. Specifically, we're looking at the wide receiver options and the running backs and the tight ends. It's important to look at all of these guys together if you're looking at the entire weapons package for the offense. If you just isolate on the receivers for any team, you're really not getting the whole picture of what a quarterback has available to him and what the offensive coordinator has available to him as he's laying out his game plans and as he's going through the, the reads on any given play, you're not getting the whole picture. It's very important to put these guys together. So there are more wide receivers than what I've got on the board today, but we, we've got just about everybody who made a major contribution in 2020. And then we've got here the top three running backs and the top three tight ends for the Jets this offseason. So we've got them all together here. It's really important to look at all of these three positions together because, again, if you just look at the wide receivers, and you say, well, they weren't good enough for 2020, and they won't be good enough for 2021, you're really not getting an accurate picture of what all you've got on the team. So very important to look at all of them together. I'm going to start with the wide receiver group, and specifically with Jamison Crowder. Crowder plays the slot position. That's just about all he's ever played in his career here uh, in the NFL. He's been consistent ever since he got into the league. Jamison Crowder got a C grade on him. Uh, really, he's making $11.5 million. I've got that rounded up to $12. $11.5 million cap hit. So you're not getting a huge deal here, but you're getting what you're paying for. 50 to 60 catches, 12 to 14 yards per catch. He stays healthy. Jamison Crowder is worth the money that we're paying him there at the slot position. And he really, really is a huge weapon here for any quarterback, no matter who's playing quarterback for the Jets next year. He is a solid weapon here at slot receiver. I love Jamison Crowder. Love the way he produces. Love the work ethic. Love the attitude. Just one of the, the best players in the league in terms of consistency. Guys that you can count on for, for really producing. Jamison Crowder is that kind of guy. Now, he's not explosive. He's not going to take the top off of defense. Um, you're not going to see a lot of yak yardage in terms of what some of the other guys can produce, but this guy is so consistent and he's he's incredibly valuable right there at that slot position. Denzel Mims, of course, drafted in the second round out of Baylor last year, had high hopes for Denzel Mims. We didn't see that in 2020. What we got was, I think, uh, less than 20 catches, and I'm not even sure he crossed the 400-yard barrier. I can't remember for sure. Not a good season out of Denzel Mims. Injuries kept him off the field early. In the middle of the season, it looked like he was starting to catch on. You know, you'd see four catches for 40 yards. You'd see five catches for 70 yards, something like that. You had several games clustered there in the middle where you're like, okay, this guy's starting to get it going. And then the end of the year came and again, just kind of disappeared there. So for Denzel Mims, I, I, I don't want to label it a disappointment, but we sure didn't get what we were all hoping we would get here as Jets fans because Mims has that explosiveness. He's the guy that you bring in. Okay, this is the guy who's really going to be the downfield threat. This is going to be the A-dog. This is going to be the guy who's going to really open up everything else here for the Jets offense, and he just didn't give us that in season number one. Now, physically, he's still got all those tools, and no matter who plays quarterback next year, we've got every reason to hope that Mims can still be the explosive receiver and even if he's not an elite guy, just a high production kind of a guy for years to come. So we'll hold out that hope, but we didn't get that in 2020 from Mims. Financially, that's not a big deal because he's only making about a million dollars. I forget if he's $950,000 next season, but the cap number is, is incredibly small. It would be almost impossible to beat it. So financially here, whether he produces or he doesn't, you're not taking any kind of a beating there. Rashad Perriman. Perriman's an interesting guy. You know, when he was originally drafted, I think by the Ravens five years ago, um, a lot of hopes here for this guy that, that he could have been a stud in the league. He hasn't really been that. Injuries have been a huge part of that, but also at times just flat out inconsistent. So injuries and inconsistency, those are the two things that tend to get a lot of players in this league in terms of being a star or even holding on to the starting spot. And Perriman has the physical tools, just like Denzel Mims. Perriman has the speed, enough speed, and he has the phys physicality to be a productive receiver. And we've seen him be productive for a couple of seasons. 
again, not what you would hope necessarily when you drafted him, but when he moved on to, I think, Tampa Bay in 2019, had a productive season, moved on over here to the Jets, and, and we get, you know, I think 30 catches and 400 yards, more or less. So I would like to bring Brashad Perryman back, but not at $6.5 million. And again, I've got him rounded up to $7 million. He's basically, I think, the only major free agent out of, out of these players here. We'll talk about Gore in a second. But Perriman's a free agent. I would like to bring him back on the team, but not at $6.5 million. And we're coming out with another video where we'll do a, a contract only on Brashad Perriman here. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. But I would like to have Perriman back. Physically, he's got all the tools. And he has produced at times in this league for Tampa Bay, and I think maybe for Cleveland before that. He's had a couple of productive seasons, so it's not like we haven't seen him do it. But again, 2020, we just didn't get that. Now, I, I know as you start to look through these receivers, how you grade them, you know, do you blame the offensive coordinator? Do you blame the quarterback position? When you start to talk about Mims and Perriman not producing at the level you want, that's where you really have to start going back through and breaking down the tape. And I think there's plenty of reason to say, yes, the OC and the quarterback weren't getting it done. But at the same time, Mims and Perryman have a lot of room to grow here and a lot, a lot of room here to truly, truly develop into what we hope that they'll be, even though Perryman is a good bit farther down the road in his career. So I want to bring Perryman back, but not at that $6.5 million price. Talk about that more in a different video. Braxton Berrios is a guy. I love Berrios on the team and fourth on the depth chart, more or less. I know we're mixing up slot receivers and everybody here, but Berrios being fourth on the depth chart is just about right for him. He's a productive receiver. He is never, I don't, I don't think, ever going to be a star in this league, but he contributes on special teams. And this is an excellent backup to bring in if you want to go four wide or five wide. Barrios being a part of that, that's there's value to be had there. And again, you're only paying him about a million dollars this season either, uh, more or less. So this is this is not a guy you want to be a full-time starter by any stretch. But Braxton Barrios is a guy who contributes, who is valuable. He is productive. If he had to play the whole season as a starter, you wouldn't be hurting the same way that you would be hurting if a fifth-round draft pick came in for his first season the production there is just two vastly different levels so there is production here with Berrios he does provide legitimate depth here at the wide receiver position and then you move down to Smith um Jeff I think yeah that's Jeff Smith not really sure yet what what he's going to be in this league only a million dollars we'll, we'll see if he gets to keep his roster spot for next season when you look at the wide receivers as a whole just this wide receiver group a little bit disappointing, some production, some hope that these guys can do a lot better next year. The splashy thing to do here is, and, and you'll see this on just about every article you see written about the Jets, and just, just about every TV uh, se segment that you see about the upgr upgrading the Jets, is to go out and spend a lot of money in free agency on wide receiver. And that's fine if they do that. It's exciting. It's a, it's a sure way to inject excitement into the offense by, you know, but you're going to pay 14 to 18 million dollars on a wide receiver to do that. To to really bring in a guy on free agency, you're you're always going to overpay. It's just the nature. So my personal feeling is I'm going to take the free agency money and put it down here at running back and tight end. I know that's not the exciting thing to do, but I think it's the smarter thing to do. We'll talk about that more in a second. What I would do here at wide receiver is one of those two picks that you have, late first round, early second round. I think you have two picks right there, very close. I would use one pick there. It's so much cheaper to grow your own wide receivers than it is to go out and get one on the free agent market. You're going to overpay. Um, even, even teams who have to pay their own wide receivers, but it's guys that they've drafted, usually pay them a, a good bit less than somebody who has to go out on the free agent market and, and pay for a guy who has already actually proven. They, listen, you can go out and get all kinds of wide receivers who haven't proven a darn thing in this league, but if you're going to get somebody who's a truly legit stud at wide receiver, you're going to pay a hefty amount of money 
And it's not just the cap hit that you're getting, but you're tied to them for a good three or four seasons. So even if you were to have somebody like Mims or another draft pick develop at wide receiver, you're still usually stuck with the guy that you, you paid all that money to. And that money could really be used somewhere else. And it's just cheaper to grow your own wide receiver. So personally, and again, I have no problem with the Jets at all if they go out and they make a big splash here at free agency and wide receiver. But I personally would rather just see them draft another guy here, not giving up on Mims by any stretch. But I just think it would be a, a smarter thing to do cap-wise to draft somebody right there in that late first, early second round, whichever pick is more convenient, and, and get somebody here at wide receiver than to throw a lot of money right there at wide receiver. And the other reason I really, really endorse that, and a lot of people don't agree with this, a lot of people don't even see this, it makes you very dependent on that one player that you've invested a lot of money in. Statistically speaking, he's going to play a thousand snaps if he's healthy, but by playing more snaps, he's more likely to get injured. And when that guy goes down, and statistically there's a very good chance of that, you're looking still at other holes that you couldn't fill because you spent money there at that one position, just that one wide receiver position. And, and then you have another season where you're talking about, well, if our best wide receiver hadn't have gotten injured, we would have had a lot better year. To me, it's a lot better to spread that money around on cheaper positions like tight end and running back that you still know will upgrade the offense. And then I'm gonna go get my stud wide receiver somewhere in the late first or early second round. If that works out, it doesn't always. But again, that's just my way. Um, I know the popular thing to do there is spend a lot of money at wide receiver. And if the Jets do that, it's not gonna bother me at all. So I think we've covered the wide receivers pretty well here. Running back, didn't get much out of running back this year. Didn't pay much for it either. You know, you basically got three guys here who are making about a million dollars each. Uh, a couple, I think, uh, I think Ty Johnson here made $750,000 last year. He's going to be maybe $850,000 this season. Frank Gore, I think you can get him back for $1.1 million, something like that. So with Gore, P. Ryan, and Johnson, you've got three guys here who you just didn't get a lot out of. Now, my heart really, really wants to bring Gore back. Okay, statistically, though, these three guys, they all produced more or less about the same. Now, um, Ty Johnson had the one game, and I felt bad for him. He had the game of his life, of his two-year career, against the, uh, the Raiders, and, and nobody gave it any attention at all because of the way the game ended. Nobody uh, said hardly a thing about Ty Johnson's career day that day. I think it was 22 uh, carries for 104 yards, something like that. So Ty Johnson... We saw him do it for one game. Uh, do you bring him back? Um, I'm inclined to let Ty Johnson go and, and fill his spot with a lower round draft pick, a fourth or fifth round draft pick. I would love to continue to inject some youth right there at that position. And while I would love to bring Gore back, and I might even bring him back for a million dollars, I would really, really, really love to see the Jets here spend about four or five million dollars. And again, this isn't splashy, but this is an instant upgrade to your offense. Bring in a guy who basically is what Frank Gore was five or six years ago. Now, Gore can still contribute. Um, it's not like he had a bad season, but we know he's on the last legs of his career here. So even though I would love to bring Gore back, and I may do that anyway, I absolutely want to see the Jets here spend about four or five million dollars on a running back, a veteran, who he may not be in the upper class of the league. I don't care. I just want a guy who I know can catch the ball to the backfield for 30 or 40 catches. And I want a guy who can run the ball between the tackles. And I've seen him do that at some other location who just doesn't need his services anymore. And that's an instant way to upgrade the offense. And that's one reason it's so important to look at all of these guys together if I upgrade at running back, I have instantly helped whoever plays quarterback next season. As long as I bring in a guy who is guaranteed to catch the football and is guaranteed to be able to produce in between the tackles, has enough speed to be able to do both of those things. And then P. Ryan, of course, we have every hope. Again, P. Ryan's a guy who we, we had hopes that, that he would have a big season. Didn't get much. It was pretty quiet, in all honesty, and that's true of all three running backs. You could blame the offensive line for that maybe in the first part of the season, but by the, by the time the season ended, the offensive line was competitive for most of the year. 
Um, these three running backs just did not produce a whole lot. They, they weren't bad, but they weren't giving us a whole lot either. Financially, you don't have a lot invested here. So that's what I want to do right here at running back. My hopes are P. Ryan steps up and he's the workhorse next year. Whether he is or isn't, I'm bringing in a guy at running back for 4 or $5 million who I know will catch the football, who I know will pick up blitzes, who I know will run between the tackles. And then it's up to me to bring back either Gore or Johnson, not both, maybe neither. And then I'm going to draft somebody around the fourth, fifth, sixth round here at running back just to inject some more quickness and some more youth right there at the running back position. Tight end here, Chris Herndon, Griffin, and then Wesco. Personally, I'm going to let Wesco go. You can bring them all back. None of them are free agents next season. None of them are costing you a lot. Griffin's costing you $3 million. You could let him go for about a $2 million cap hit if you want to. Herndon's a guy. Man, 2018, it looked like Chris Herndon was the guy, didn't it? I mean, he, he had an excellent season. He, he wasn't top five or anything, but he had a good year. And then 2018, I mean, 2019 comes around, he's injured. 2020 comes around, and we're all hoping we get, we get him back, and, and it just didn't happen. Chris Herndon just didn't produce. I want to keep Chris Herndon. I just don't want to keep him as my starter. So I'm going to move Chris Herndon, ideally. I'm going to move Chris Herndon down to my backup tight end. I'm going to move Griffin down to my uh, a third tight end. I'm going to let Wesco go. Um, it's not going to cost me much to let him go. I'm going to spend about $10 million here at tight end. This is cheaper. You know, you spend $14 or $18 million at wide receiver. You're tied to him for three or four years. At tight end, for anywhere from 9 to $11 million, I'm going to call it $10 million, you can bring in a guy who instantly upgrades the offense. And usually for tight ends, you don't have to come up with a four- or five-year deal. Usually you can do it for a two- or three-year deal. You're not tied to them for as long, and it would instantly upgrade here at tight end. And that's a, that's a valuable thing for young quarterbacks, whether it's Sam Darnold or somebody else. Tight ends can often be their best friend because no matter who you got at wide receiver, it still takes time for those longer routes to develop. And a lot of times, quarterbacks love being able to dump the ball off to their tight end, but there's just nobody here who's getting open enough to do that. So I'm going to go into the free agents. And again, this is unpredictable. Things don't always work out this way. I have no clue who's actually going to be available in free agency at tight end. If it's just one guy, there may be a lot of teams bidding for his services, and, and he may not be affordable anymore. But ideally, if there's two or three guys sitting there at tight end and, and there's not a lot of bidding up on those two or three guys, I want to get one from somewhere who's had a, a pretty high catch total um, over his career. He's been consistent. He didn't just have one career uh, one career year. He's, he's been pretty consistent. I want to bring somebody in at tight end, and I'm willing to pay for that. I'm willing to pay $10 million a season for that hopefully on something like a three-year deal where I'm not tied to them for a long time. Hopefully somebody who's around 27, 28 years old. That's ideally what I'm looking at. We'll see if that happens or not. That's a lot cheaper to be able to do that. And the one thing, this is the, this is the thing that a lot of people miss. If I start to break up that money and I invest some here at running back and I invest some here at tight end, the injuries are coming. They come every year. And every season... Teams uh, who don't win a lot, uh, their fans talk about, well, if we just hadn't been injured, if we just hadn't been injured, this is one of the ways that you fight against injuries. You spread the money out. Instead of having one guy here that we're all counting on to just be a 100-catch kind of a guy and have a 1,000 yards and just really break open the offense, which he can do, and that's valuable, Instead of doing that, I've now got guys at tight end and running back, and if one person goes down, oh well, we readjust. It, it's not the end of the world if my one guy goes down. But again, that's just my way. A lot of NFL execs like to do it a lot different than that. So we'll see what the Jets do here. We'll see what you guys want to do as well. That's kind of what I'm looking at here, um, right here at the tight end position. Herndon moves down, Griffin moves down, Wesco goes. I, I, I pay $10 million a year here at tight end. I probably don't draft the tight end this season. I think uh, Herndon is young enough to still have a chance that maybe in 2021, he's back to the Herndon that we saw in 2018, but I'm not going to count on that. 
going to bring in somebody here at tight end who's guaranteed to upgrade. And, and then back here, running back and wide receiver, we already went through what we're going to do there. All right, that's it for now. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. We're covering Brashad Perryman's contract. We'll be covering the uh, cornerbacks and on all the defensive backs. We'll work our way through the entire team. Thank you very much. Bye.